Hi and welcome to the TAE DEL 301A Provide Work Skill Instruction Unit of Competence. Uh, this unit of competence is part of the Cert 4 Car Driving Instructor Qualification. This presentation, the unit information and any handout materials presented in this session will be available to you via the student portal. Support for this unit of competence uh, will come through our face-to-face -face webinars, our assessment walkthroughs and obviously any information provided on the portal. Intelligent Training Solutions prides itself on providing support to its students Monday to Friday, as I'm sure you are well aware. Uh, as you know, we have gone through uh, several improvements to our support services beyond what is listed on this screen in front of you. At the same time now, you know that you can click onto the Student Support tab via the Moodle Access page on our website and book directly uh, with us at uh, times that you're available and needing student support whether that be over phone, Skype or face-to-face. -face. In order to achieve competency for this unit you'll be required to successfully complete the student assessment. For a more thorough and detailed understanding of the, what's required uh, for the student assessment attached to this unit of competence I suggest you click on the student assessment walkthrough attached to this unit of competence and its assessment. The unit's elements and performance criteria can be downloaded from www.training.gov.au or alternatively via our student portal. At the same time, some of the information presented within this presentation uh, comes to you from the Small Print Learner Guide. If you wish to purchase a copy of that guide, click onto www.smallprint.com.au to purchase your own copy. Although Intelligent Training Solutions fundamentally agrees with the information found on this slide, we'd always throw in a precursor statement uh, for you to consider. And that would be, just because you know how to do something doesn't mean you have an ability to teach it. And likewise, within a workplace setting, just because a worker has got a passion or a, a true uh, love of their job and have been very experienced in that job and have refined their skills to be the best at it, uh, over their their journey in the workplace, it doesn't automatically mean that they have a willingness uh, to pass on that information to others or likewise a, a knowledge base uh, to be able to teach that to others. However, with that in mind, we do agree with the following statement. Uh, very often the people who make the best trainers or coaches are those who are the job experts in their field. Their knowledge and understanding of all elements of the job mean that they are uniquely qualified to pass on that knowledge to others to answer complex questions and to understand the full scope and dimensions of the task. It is common practice in the workplace for experienced workers to train the newer and less experienced employees. They may do this formally or informally or a combination of both. Training in the workplace may be set out and performed in a formal or informal setting. Uh, formal training may consist of gathering and documenting specific knowledge to gain a qualification, not unlike a traineeship or an apprenticeship, or for the context of a driving instructor, someone going through uh, the process of learning how to drive uh, to formally uh, achieve a license, a Victorian driver's license. Induction procedures for workplaces and equipment. Uh, from a driver's trainer's point of view, that may be uh, someone uh, that who is attached to a workplace as a driver trainer, and maybe new employees or, or workplaces that have overseas uh, workers uh, before they're allowed to drive a company vehicle must go through some sort of uh, formal training process with you uh, where you can tick them off that they know how to drive on our side of the road, they know how to use the company vehicles and they're familiar enough with Victorian law, uh, Victorian road law to be able to successfully drive their company vehicle. Uh, that obviously has a natural progression to being in-house training. So once again, we know some of our trainees uh, will g not uh, just go, off, go out there and work with uh, novice learner drivers, but they may find uh, the, a job role within uh, in-house within an organisation, and they'll conduct in-house training for the for those uh, new workers or inexperienced workers, and that may include how to drive a vehicle to how to wash a car, so to speak. Uh, you also may find yourself as an appoint appointed mentor or coach. Uh, working through long term with people and obviously a lot of 
workplaces have their more experienced uh, work, uh, workers um, take on a mentor or coaching role with those uh, less experienced or uh, new uh, employees that are new to, to a particular job role or function and take on a formal uh, training process where they're appointed. Uh, the, they, they come to an agreement where uh, employee one will play the role as a mentor or coach to employee two, so to speak. Informal training uh, training may also consist of, uh, if you can imagine yourself as a, a trainee within a workplace that you you go about asking just questions to your supervisors and co-workers as you perform your job on a daily role and, and, and you take, uh, take on your daily tasks. Uh, that can also consist of you watching your co-workers perform certain tasks, uh, practice that without supervision and asking for advice from more experienced co-workers. And if you think of your role as a driver trainer, you'll take on um, the formal training uh, process. But if you think about how we like to teach uh, learner drivers, some of that informal training is going to take place, that your learners are going to ask you certain questions to, in regards to driving a motor vehicle. And it could be directly involved with car control or road law understanding or even something to do with attitudes and, and skills and, and, and understanding how um, fellow road users use the road and how they can fit in. They'll also obviously maybe at different times watch you perform certain vehicle tasks as a part of your training and especially if you're using uh, the DEDICT uh, training method or the EDIP training method then there's certainly going to be uh, sections of that where they're watching you perform a task either at normal speed or broken up into slow speed. Uh, you're going to ask them to practice without supervision. You're going to train them. Uh, you're going to move into that coaching role yourself and you're going to ask them to do particular tasks and you're not going to intervene at all with any instruction. You're going to watch them undertake those tasks without supervision and likewise if you were to go back to your learner driver you can think about how they're going to ask you for advice on, on many things uh, not unlike the first stop point in informal training. Why train in the workplace? Learning in a classroom or off the job uh, learning environment certainly has its place. Uh, moving away from the content on the screen, obviously in some situations it's just far too dangerous to train uh, particular jobs or job roles within the workplace environment just through OH&S or a myriad of other reasons. Um, but likewise, uh, for, m for many learners, what is missing in their understanding of any particular task being taught to them is how it works in the workplace environment. Uh, many people feel that learning on the job in a real workplace is the most effective learning environment and especially for our global learners who like to see the big picture uh, before they uh, go along and learn uh, a, new, a new subject or new topic. Uh, for those people learning in the workplace has great advantages uh, because obviously for one they can uh, understand how the job contributes to the overall business uh, for us as driver trainers, we're quite lucky. Virtually all our training is conducted in the vehicle uh, out on the roads. And for our learner drivers, that's their workplace, the motor vehicle on the roads. So they uh, very much and very quickly can understand that what they're learning, they have a, a very quick and real understanding of how that contributes to their overall life on the road, um, which in some ways we could call for this situation their business. Um, they can experience workplace culture. So we know for some people from a non-driver training point of view, when they are learning a new task on the job, they can see how uh, the workplace culture um, uh, interacts with the new tasks that they're being learnt. And likewise for us as driver trainers, uh, our learners can see that by learning how to drive correctly, by maybe doing something like a head check, how and, and indicating correctly, say for instance, when changing lanes, how that promotes that culture of road safety and, and uh, respect and, and understanding of, of other drivers and, and understand that road place culture and how they fit in to that. Um, obviously be, by being able to perform the tasks in real time and real situations, uh, uh, any learner within any workplace um, can see the direct benefit and understand how that fits into their new job role. And again, for our learner drivers, what a, what a great advantage it is for them. Uh, we teach them something new and then they're able to perform that task uh, on the road in a real life situation. Uh, no simulator is going to beat that at any stage.
Uh, applying and reinforcing the skills immediately, again, can be quite important for a lot of uh, learners, especially our kinesthetic learners. If we do believe in learning styles, uh, then our, for our kinesthetic learners, especially um, those who, who like to uh, learn by doing, uh, by being able to uh, take what we've just taught them and do it on the road um, straight away, they're going to be able to reinforce those skills in a, in a real life situation. And not just really our kinesthetic learners, um, we sort of tend to believe now here at Intelligent Training Solutions that uh, no matter what anyone's learning style is or whether or not learning styles exist, as long as what we teach has a connected meaning uh, for our clients, it's going to have great benefits and outcomes. And for the final dot point, identifying employment opportunities. Uh, as we, what we do know is that when people uh, learn a new skill set or a new task within a workplace, uh, they're able to a little bit self-reflect, or not even just self-reflect, but they can see what they've learned and, and look at their workplace and say, you know what, I can pick up this skill and not only do it uh, in this situation, but I think I can apply it there over in that situation. And that may uh, lead to a promotion or a new uh, 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 job role, so to speak. Or likewise, they can say, even though I can do this within this workplace, I know that the workplace around the corner, that other business, they're not doing that yet. And I believe I can take this uh, skill set, I can pick it up, and I can uh, move it to another workplace, once again for a new job or for a promotion or whatever the case may be. From an industry point of view, it's important for you to understand that driving schools such as RACV, Excel, and even VIP um, will quite often, as you move from us into industry, partner you with a senior instructor uh, that will spend some time with you just getting you to one watch them perform the job role and also uh, maybe understand any particular procedures or preferences that they have in regards to the way they conduct driver training and, and that's of course really important because there are certain aspects that we can't uh, cover within a course like this because at the end of the day individual Driving schools and workplaces are going to have their individual uh, needs that need to be passed on to you as you enter industry with them. Senior instructors or workers within your organization who are selected to train other people are usually good at their job and are confident with the full range of skills and knowledge specific to that industry. Uh, good workers and trainers are driven to share industry knowledge to improve overall industry performance and standard. A good or competent worker trainer is someone who performs the job to the required workplace and industry standards. This worker not only does a good job, but understands what a good job is. All jobs have different aspects to their performance. All jobs require people to have skills, the things that they are able to do, knowledge, things that need to be understood, and finally attitudes, how the job should be approached. And as a driver trainer, it's going to be so important that you understand that when you teach someone a new task that you're going to be teaching them the skill, how to do it, the knowledge, that's that understanding of road law or anything else obtained to that, and then the attitude, um, how to do it correctly. And if you can imagine teaching someone to an approach in a, a, skill, a, a stop sign where they approach it smoothly and stop and don't even think about taking off until they confirm uh, that it's free to go, understanding who they need to give way to and, and how to give way to people and then be able to take off from that in a, in a safe way is an encapsulation of the skills, knowledge and attitude required to approach and stop at a stop sign correctly. Appropriate to someone that could go flying up to a stop sign, slam on the brakes to a screeching halt, quickly look left and right and then jump on the gas and do a big burnout and cut everyone off um, and take off into the distance. Theoretically, they've met their obligation of stopping at the stop sign uh, they certainly have the skills on knowing how to stop a motor vehicle, uh, how to look left and right and how to take off, but their attitude was all wrong. So understanding the skills, knowledge and attitude is an important component uh, of a good workplace trainer or for us a good driver trainer. A work skill refers to the doing aspect of a job. A work skill applies knowledge in a practical way to get something done. A skill is not always a physical act or process. It can be an interpersonal skill, a communication skill, or even a computational skill. Dividing workplace tasks into individual skills can help when providing instruction. On the next slide, we'll provide you with an example of the division of a workplace task into skills when teaching a novice learner driver how to park a vehicle. 
This example illustrates the difference between a skill, knowledge and an attitude. Although the focus of this unit is on the work skills, the other two components, knowledge and attitudes, are closely tied in with work skill instructions and performance of a work skill. It would be easier to think that as we look at this table below, that the skills, knowledge and attitude that are listed in each uh, text box is all about what the learner must do in order to reverse park a car, but in actual fact it isn't. It's listing the skills, knowledge and attitude required by the trainer to be able to teach the task of reverse parking. And that is a great reminder of the difference between just because you know something uh, means that you're able to teach it. Because this table clearly identifies that, yes, this driving instructor may know how to reverse park a car, but it's in actual fact what's listed within those text boxes, it's what's required of him or her to be able to teach that correctly. So if we quickly go through the first couple of boxes, it says that the skills uh, for the driving instructor is that they can scan the road behind and to the side of the vehicle and ahead for oncoming traffic and or hazards. So that's about the driving instructor having the ability to make, uh, maintain a safe uh, learning environment. The knowledge uh, also reflects that they have an identification of the readiness of the novice learner's driver's ability to take on that new information. So um, one, we've got a safe environment. Two, is the learner ready? Uh, to start listening and, 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 and learning from what we're about to say. And the attitude is that the um, that we have an attention uh, to the learner's emotional status and the attention to the detail of the content that we're about to teach. Because again, it's no use you making up your mind that it's now time for you to teach reverse parking when the learner is completely uh, panicked and freaked out about the vehicles that are driving around you because you've chosen to, to teach it on a busy road and not a quiet road and you start trying to teach it but they're not even listening because they're more distracted by other things going on around them. It's a perfect example of uh, how the skills, knowledge and attitude to teach something is far greater than just the ability of the task that uh, you're wishing to train. It is important for facilitators and trainers to recognize that skills refer to more than just physical skills. The facilitator needs to ensure that the separate skills of a task are identified and included in the training. Skills can be divided into four different types, and these are technical skills, task management skills, contingency management skills, job or job role environment skills. If we were to break down a task for a worker undergoing training in photocopy support, a thrilling career path uh, it may be, however to break up uh, those different uh, task skills and management skills and contingency management skills into a real life situation for you to uh, understand and get a hold of, it might look like the table below. So the technical or task skills are to perform hands-on actions, uh, manipulation and tasks. An example would be to uh, place the original page on the screen, uh, closing the flap and loading the blank paper into the tray. The task management skills may include uh, plan and organize the task or technical skills. An example of that would be to uh, selecting the right number of copies and placing multiple copies in the right order. The contingency management skills uh, may also include to deal with problems or events that are unexpected, uh, so we have to have contingencies. An example of that would be to identify when a jam has occurred, uh, remove the paper from the rollers or call the repairer, or even move on to a different uh, photocopy machine if it's available. And finally, the job role environment skills uh, might include that act in a way that is appropriate to the job in the workplace, and an example of that, of that would be to follow any OHS procedures and enact any maintenance requirements. Work skills instruction requires careful planning and with planning comes some terms and definitions which you may or may not be familiar with. The following diagram will provide you with a basic concept of how you start your planning by identifying the work skill or objective and then work backwards. Well, what does that all mean? Well the funny thing in needing to teach people a particular task or a particular thing is that quite often the best way to go about teaching that is to reverse engineer. Well, what does that all mean? Well, what it means is this. Step one is the skill objective. And the skill objective is the finished product. 
So you need to understand what the finished product needs to be. So for us, whether that's a reverse park or a three-point turn or a takeoff or how to drive through a roundabout, how you do that correctly is your skill objective or how a person would perform that task or any one of those tasks uh, correctly, abiding by the right skills, attitude and knowledge, that's your skill objective. And from that, that finished product of how to do that correctly, we break down the task. So for instance, for someone approaching a roundabout, that's all about checking your mirrors on the approach. If they're going to turn, putting on their signal nice and early, uh, slowing down to an appropriate speed for the roundabout uh, before they reach the roundabout. If they're in a manual car, that will mean that they are selecting the right gear before they get there. And then obviously, we start to then move into the give way rules and who they need to give way to and then the car placement. So when we look at what it takes to you know, turn right safely at a roundabout, we're going to break down all those tasks using the system of uh, car control, using uh, the give way laws and any you know, correct attitude or behaviours that are associated with that. From that, we can come up with a delivery plan of how we want to teach that. Um, and what it's going to take to teach it and, and the step-by-step -step process of teaching that. And, and that could probably for us include uh, to dict and a, or a dip as, our, as a part of that uh, delivery plan. And then, of course, we have the learning program, which is how it's all going to fit in, how we're going to maybe uh, use to dict and demonstrate and explain and, and how whether that's going to take, a, you know, that whole process of learning how to turn safely uh, at a roundabout is going to be a 10-minute process or a... Uh, two-day process or a four-month process so to speak so all those things come together in a reverse engineered kind of way because we start off with what's the goal what the objective is and then break it down and plan accordingly we just don't come up with a learning program and work towards the skill objective we first of all recognize what needs to be achieved however before developing any workplace learning programs trainers coaches and mentors need to understand the characteristics of our learners. They need to identify organizational needs and collaborate with proposed learners to identify any specific learner needs, clear learning goals and objectives, and any characteristics that might impact on learning outcomes. When people enter the workforce, either as a driving instructor or a warehouse worker, they learn a new range of work-related skills. Some people have, will have completed training at school, at TAFE, university, or even with a registered training organisation like ourselves and have earned qualifications related to their work. There will be others that just purely learn on the job. And just to clarify the three dot points associated with this slide, I'm going to explain to you, it to you in two different uh, approaches. As you can imagine, if you are a uh, training organisation that offers workplace training even to do with safe driving, Obviously, as you deal with different businesses, even though your final goal as a driver trainer is to have all those people driving vehicles safely and in a way that where they're not going to crash or break the law, the reality is each workplace is going to have maybe different uh, employees at different skill levels. Or individual workplaces may have highly skilled drivers that need training in a specific area compared to another workplace that has people that have very low skill sets of driving and you need to again have the same goal of creating safe drivers but the whole particular and individual needs of those learners uh, may be completely different to the others from the other workplace so each individual workplace will have the required goal of you to create safe drivers but the individual needs of those people undertaking that um, will need to be uh, collaborated with and organized with and certainly identified before you go too deep into your training. And from a driving instructor point of view, on a very simple task or in a very simple example, is that you could have two learners, one with 120 hours of practice and one who got their learner permit yesterday and is yet to sit in a, in a vehicle for the first time uh, in the driver's seat. Uh, both learners will want to become the best, safest drivers they can possibly be and to pass their drive test. However, their particular individual needs are going to be vastly different, although your overall goal is the same. Which comes down to the second part, 
which is that once we have understood the specific learner needs, you're going to be able to develop clear learning goals and objectives for each lesson. And that's so important because that is the bit that differentiates us from a parent with supervised 120 hours practice to the time spent with us as driving instructors. You should, as a driving instructor, always have clear learning goals and objectives for each lesson. In other words, you should be performance orientated and task focused. So for each lesson, you're going to have a clear performance or a clear learning goal and then you're going to put together the environment and the places and the spaces and the information required to perform those tasks or to meet those objectives. And at the end of the day, the third dot point, uh, the characteristics that might impact on the learning outcomes need to be taken uh, into consideration. And when we speak about uh, a learner's characteristics, we're talking about who they are and what they are. So if you're dealing with someone who is uh, their particular characteristic from a learner driver point of view is that they are quite nervous and timid and don't have much experience, um, then the way you uh, approach their training may be completely different to someone who is overconfident, uh, displays uh, or demonstrates poor driving attitudes and um, and it's quite dangerous on the road, so to speak. So even though, again, the, the, the overall outcome is to produce two safe drivers, uh, their personal characteristics dependent upon their education, their, uh, their attitudes and knowledge, uh, it can come down to uh, their literacy skills and their language skills, um, and even their, like I said, their workplaces, environments, or their own personal environments, all those things need to be considered because it will have an impact on how you conduct that training. And from a formal point of view, training within a workplace, you can imagine that all that stuff needs to be documented and you will need to uh, show how you can allow for that and you can demonstrate how you've got contingencies in place and you'll be able to deliver a wonderful training product to their staff. Or likewise, in a less formal process as a driver trainer, that's looking at your ability to be uh, flexible in what you do and, and not fall into the trap of saying to yourself that I have one approach to every learner that hops in my vehicle and regardless of whether they really fit that approach, that's the way I'm going to teach it because that'll be letting yourself down and your clients down. As discussed in previous sessions, all new employees should receive an appropriate induction, suitable on-the-job training for the work they need to do, including any health and safety training, and information that will help them do their jobs. They'll be advised of the work standards they need to meet. Driving school owners, managers or CEOs cannot expect people to simply be able to do things the way they want them to do it if they haven't received any sort of instruction or training. Every day, in the normal course of their work, people will learn. They perform specific work tasks, interact with other people, solve problems, and deal with new situations, and apply the skills they have already uh, learned um, from those or in those new situations. We can almost say that it'll take you the better part of two years in the driver training industry before you reach a stage in your career where you feel that your learning curve will have started to slow down. Even today we have driving instructors who have worked for over 10 years within the driver training industry that are still learning new things about the industry on a weekly basis. A good trainer, coach or mentor will continually be learning through their career and life. Inputs. Learning requires three inputs. First of all, there's the declarative knowledge. The facts, the theory and the comprehension. What we know to be. The procedural knowledge, which is the practical application. And third, the conditional or situational knowledge. And that's the how and when to use that knowledge in those particular workplaces, work functions or work roles. I'd now like to take the opportunity to explain the three inputs uh, in more detail. And first up is our foundation to when we learn something or understand something or the gathering of knowledge and wisdom. And the first up is declarative knowledge. And declarative knowledge is the knowledge that something is the case. It relates to what can be called factual theoretical knowledge. You must know what before you can know how and when. In other words, when learning new skills, we all need uh, the basic underpinning knowledge applicable to the skill. And if you think about 
something like uh, TLIC 303 uh, 6A apply safe car driving behaviours. When you think about how we approach teaching that subject, we started off with some theory. And first up was the road law. And then there was the theory to uh, what uh, it took, uh, the theoretical knowledge of the practical of the Hendon system of car control and uh, safe following distances and proper ob observation skills. So you learned the theory of that. We then applied that to your driving. So you then uh, moved from the, the underpinning knowledge, the understanding of, of how it is, to then being able to move on to how to do it. And if you think in a bigger picture, we use apply safe car driving behaviours as the declarative knowledge of your uh, pathway into TLIM uh, 4001A, develop safe car driving behaviours and others. So before you can teach someone how to be a safe and legal driver, um, we give you that uh, declarative knowledge through apply safe car driving behaviours itself. So safe car driving behaviours had its declarative knowledge approach uh, to help you achieve the goals associated with that unit of competence. But then in the bigger picture, we use that whole unit of competence as the declarative knowledge for you moving into apply, uh, develop safe driving behaviours and others. The second input is procedural knowledge. Procedural knowledge is the knowledge about how to do something such as how to solve long division problems or even how to reverse park a vehicle. Before we can solve a long division problem, we need to know what numbers are and what we can do with them and that's declarative knowledge. From a uh, reverse parking point of view, every individual step that makes up how to reverse park a vehicle from the looking out the back window to selecting reverse gear and which way to turn the wheel that's all a part of the procedural knowledge of how to move that vehicle from the middle of the road uh, in a backwards fashion to end up behind uh, the stationary parked vehicle beside the curb. The procedure, the step-by-step -step approach that gets us to move that vehicle from the middle of the road to behind the vehicle beside the gutter, that's your procedural knowledge. Conditional or situational knowledge. Conditional or situational knowledge is knowledge about how and when to apply knowledge in order to act appropriately, the right time and the right situation in which to apply the knowledge and procedures. Very simply, from a reverse parking point of view, that conditional situational knowledge is the ability uh, for the learner driver to understand that as I uh, move up this road looking for a car park, uh, the space provided to me on the left uh, behind that vehicle parked in that car space uh, can only uh, be achieved by uh, using the declarative and procedural knowledge applied to how to reverse, a, uh, reverse park a car. So it's all about uh, their knowledge of knowing when they can drive into a car park uh, and when they need to reverse into a car park. The training facilitator's task whether the facilitator is a trainer, coach or mentor, is to ensure that each of the conditions for acquiring and internalising learning is present in the training situation and that opportunities for learners to apply and practice new skills are available. Uh, for us as driver trainers, using either to dict or a dip will always cover that base and that's why it's so important to use those approaches. Hi, this is Alex from ITS. Thanks for watching. You've hit that point where we recommend that you pause this video, stretch your legs, and grab yourself a coffee. This video presentation will resume in about five seconds, so hit that pause button now. Just before I read out the information uh, supplied on this slide, I just want to touch base and remind you that the information that we've been speaking about previously and the information to come on the following slides is all about highlighting to you the importance of getting to know your clients or understand your clients before you go uh, flat out into delivering any training to them. Uh, by understanding their characteristics you are better able to uh, deliver any training uh, more pointed towards their particular needs and, and understanding any uh, shortfalls that they may have so you can counteract that with contingencies. Uh, likewise, I'm about to speak about uh, learning styles and even though Intelligent Training Solutions 
uh, recognises that uh, learning styles most likely exist. Uh, what we would prescribe to is that, uh, or what we believe is that probably most uh, individuals apply different learning styles to different situations to allow them to learn uh, the best they can. And what we would advocate is to always keep in mind and uh, different learning styles and try to uh, recognize any learning style that a client may have but more importantly to connect any training that you're doing with meaning and when we say meaning we mean meaning to the individual because when uh, we connect learning with meaning uh, we have clients more readily and happily to take on that information and hold on to it and make themselves uh, uh, better learners as a result of that so as it says here, uh, every learner you will meet has a preferred learning style. And each learner has different preferred ways of processing information, and this affects what we all learn and how quickly we learn. Some people, for instance, learn best by reading. Others learn by watching others. And some learn through experimentation. Some need tactical involvement and opportunities for practice. Some people learn very quickly while others require more time and more practice to fully internalize new learning. None of these ways of learning is better or more effective than any other. People simply have different learning styles. It is important, however, that training facilitators acknowledge the fact that people are all different and have different learning requirements. This is why, in order to deliver effective training, it is necessary that facilitators gather, uh, prior to designing and developing a program, sufficient appropriate information about learner characteristics and learning needs. In many respects, a driving instructor can be considered a workplace trainer, as we often need to take on different roles depending on the needs of our individual learners. Coaching and mentoring are both valuable methods of sharing knowledge and facilitating the development of skills. Whilst they do not meet the requirements of formal training, they are, in some circumstances, more effective in passing on knowledge and skills. There are differences between training, coaching and mentoring, and in particular there are subtle differences between coaching and mentoring. Although the terms are often used interchangeably, workplace mentors are generally people within the work organisation who have expertise, access to organisational resources and the ability to guide and advise employees in a wide range of matters. This can be either a formal or informal role and might be intended to provide prodigies with upward mobility and career support. I'd now like to take the opportunity to try to uh, explain and identify the difference between mentors and coaches and the like. And first up here we've got mentors. Uh, mentors build trust-based uh, relationships with the employees or learners they assist. Uh, they, the supportive relationship goes beyond teaching technical skills. Uh, mentors can provide personal support, friendship, counselling and guidance with career pathways or further study. Uh, these activities are not always publicly recognised or observable. The mentor provides credible and suitable learning opportunities for the prodigy, with correct skills enhancement uh, processes and acts as a role model for organisational behaviour and expectation, just like a driving instructor does with their learner drivers. And that's so important to understand that you, uh, a, a great driving instructor uh, can play a dual role. They'll facil facilitate environments where uh, learners are able to improve their practical skills and their physical abilities to drive a motor vehicle but at the same time, so importantly, play a mentor role where all those important uh, uh, characteristics and information and, and behaviours that will allow our learner driver not just to pass a drive test, but more importantly, survive to their 21st, 22nd or 25th birthday uh, through that danger period of, of young and experienced drivers, uh, that they can play that role as a mentor and instil those safety characteristics far beyond and, uh, any technical information or, or skills that they pass on. So please understand that we would love for you to be able to develop your physical abilities uh, to teach someone how to drive uh, safely, but also understand uh, the need or the importance of you to also hopefully play a mentor role uh, through uh, just your own driving actions and, and attitudes and behaviours but also to recognise uh, what it takes to be a safe driver far beyond just the physical activities involved with driving, but also the attitudes, uh, going back to the skills, attitude and knowledge required uh, to drive safely. As mentioned before, driver trainers will quite often uh, 
balance the role between a mentor and a coach. And, and as we talked before, coaches are, are very much uh, task-focused and performance-orientated, um, and, and that can mean that they're a little bit more specific than a mentor. However, as it says here, coaching. Coaching is usually more task-specific than mentoring. Coaches focus on helping and guiding development in a particular competency, skill, task, or area of growth. They are usually chosen for their technical expertise. Thus, coaching is a more confined and generally temporary role that ends once the necessary skill has been acquired. Another role a driving instructor takes on with their learner drivers. Um, and it's exactly that, that uh, as a mentor, we're trying to teach them how to be better, safer drivers to survive the danger years and become safe drivers for life. Yet, as a coach, we're going to teach individual things like how to reverse park and how to turn right and how to negotiate a roundabout, so to speak. The term coaching is most often heard in the context of sports, but it also applies to workplaces and particularly workplace training situations. Let's briefly examine what the coach of an elite athlete does and then discuss what might be expected of you as a learning facilitator in this role. Once an agreed long-term goal is established, for example, to win an Olympic gold medal, a coach then identifies key steps to achieving that goal, such as which competitions to enter leading up to the big event, directs the training regime, analyzes the athlete's techniques to pinpoint weaknesses, designs specific practices to improve performance, and teaches the theory that underpins the practice. Coaching devises strategies to improve performance, identifies requirements, provides guidance in areas relating to diet, vitamin enhancements and sleep habits, and concerns him or herself uh, with the athlete's motivation and psychological state. Although you will never be coaching a learner to win an Olympic medal, there is much in what an Olympic coach does that is similar to what you will do in your role. Coaching occurs when a more experienced or highly trained colleague guides, monitors and advises another in a work skill. A coach might demonstrate, model or explain a process, and a coach may have additional knowledge and processes developed through their own experience and training, which they can then pass on. Workplace training can take a number of forms. On-the-job training, which is one-to-one -one or group training, not unlike a driving instructor working with a client one-on-one. Off-the-job training, in-house or an external. Uh, online training via the internet, uh, blended delivery, as some of you guys uh, do with intelligent training solutions from either internal or external sources, uh, coaching and mentoring. Uh, training might be one-to-one uh, -one or it might involve groups of people in the workplace. So it's important to remember that you know the purpose of the proposed training and the training objectives must be clearly identified so that you know the required outcomes can be communicated to the learners and other stakeholders and for us in some ways we're talking about at the start of each lesson we, we clearly explain to our clients what we hope to achieve today and how we're going to achieve it. Uh, that we that as trainers we understand what is required of them. Uh, learners understand what is required of them and what will be achieved. Uh, training can be accurately targeted. Uh, training plans can be developed. And that from a driver trainer's point of view can either be an informal process uh, developed uh, internally or mentally so to speak. Uh, or also being maybe a little bit better at our job and a little bit more organized and having it all documented. Um, it also includes that appropriate training methods and resources can be identified and that management understand how the training will benefit the organization. And for us, that might be going back to a, a, a learner's mum or dad or, or an organizing body and just reminding them of, of the benefits of undertaking training with you and your driving school. Characteristics. To gather suitable information regarding learner characteristics and learning needs, uh, a learner profile can be useful. A profile will identify the learner's needs and what they can already do. Uh, it is necessary to assess the current skills of the individuals against the relevant competency standards uh, to recognise what they already know. So they are not forced to engage in repeat training or to participate in training which addresses skills they already have. Uh, from a driver training point of view, that's really important. Uh, understanding very early on what your clients know or understand compared to what they need to know or understand is vitally important. It allows you to deliver targeted training because we know whether we're training adults or young adults, we nearly all get turned off from the training experience very quickly once we firmly believe that we're being taught stuff that we already know. And that has something to do with the principles of adult education, which we're going to cover a little bit later on. 
But understanding what a learner knows compared to what they need to know, so you can target that training to that uh, pre-described or, or pre-determined goal is hugely important. And likewise, uh, understanding and spending some time uh, with your clients uh, before they start to understand any cultural characteristics or nationality uh, considerations or, or religious considerations, uh, let alone uh, their age or their previous experiences, will once again allow you to develop the best training possible. So as it says here in the final paragraph, uh, training facilitators uh, will need basic information regarding the potential learner's age, work experience and previous training and qualifications. Uh, cultural characteristics and special needs will also contribute to a learner profile. And a classic case for intelligent training solutions doing a better job by understanding their learner characteristics is that quite often uh, in the early days we used to uh, uh, deliver uh, in-vehicle training on a, on our, in our full-time courses on a Friday. But obviously for all our uh, Muslim clients, that was a, a huge inconvenience. Um, uh, for them, obviously, wanting to attend mosque on a Friday uh, disturbed their time with us in vehicle. And it also threw out our days as we weren't able to have um, as much time with them as we wanted to. So the easiest fix that Alex and I came up with was to move the, the training days, the in-vehicle training days, to a Wednesday and a Thursday, which benefited everyone. Our Muslim clients were able to uh, attend mosque on, 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 on Fridays, which is obviously important for them and something that we completely respect and, and, um, and promote. And likewise, for our trainers and for us as an organization, we didn't lose that valuable training time um, of, of that one-on-one uh, -on -one in vehicle training uh, to, to that um, uh, cultural need. So it was a great uh, learning experience for Alex and I and, and one that we all benefited from. Learner characteristics that might also impact on training could include language, literacy and numeracy levels and abilities, identified preferred learning styles, life experience and impact on the workplace culture. As driving instructors, it's important to identify your learner's characteristics and find out what they can already do. So many driving instructors find it easier just to start at the beginning with a learner driver rather than take the time to identify the, the learner's abilities. Uh, this slack approach to training will cause your learners to get frustrated and most likely move off to other providers. Uh, to build a learner's profile, it may be necessary to conduct some sort of driving assessment prior to the lesson. A, a classic case of, of, of just once you've gone through and met the client and, and asked a few questions and, and, and found out about them, just to say, hey, before I start training you, I'm just going to pop you on a drive for five to ten minutes. Um, I'm going to look at what you're doing. Don't worry, there's no pass or fail uh, applying to this. But by uh, letting me just watch what you can do, um, I'll know what to teach you uh, right from the start and I won't waste any unnecessary time uh, teaching you stuff you already know. Um, most uh, clients really appreciate that approach. So as it says here, to build a learner's profile, it may be necessary to A, uh, conduct a formal driving assessment prior to training, which will provide you with the ability to see the learner driver in raw form. B, uh, utilize parent, supervisor, and in the case of workplaces, uh, managers and peer feedback. And it could also, for us as driver trainers, include the learner logbook. Uh, C, conduct verbal or written tests. Uh, just a quick Q&A, you know, tell me about this, what do you know about that, so to speak, and get a bit of feedback and see uh, their, or measure their, their body of knowledge. And finally, D, collect information from the participants about prior training and learning they, have may, they may have undertaken. And like I said, a quick uh, five-minute informal uh, interview at the start when you first meet the client, asking them what they know and what their experiences are, coupled with a, a, a short informal drive assessment will very quickly allow you to understand uh, and gather all their characteristics and, and needs and, and be able to have much more successful training outcomes. A learner profile can help driving instructors and facilitators design programs and training sessions that one, create for the learning capabilities of the participants, including literacy and numeracy abilities, uh, two, will have a real and applicable purpose, three, do not repeat learning that participants have already successfully undertaken, as mentioned before, and four, offer uh, stretch goals and components, five, reinforce without repeating the learning for their current skills and their knowledge, uh, but, uh, six, encourage learners to share with each other their skills and ideas. Seven, provide for adequate uh, learning support. 
And finally, uh, meet the learning style preference needs uh, of learners. And all that is so important because it makes for a more effective, enjoyable, prosperous learning environment. In a formal sense, to develop learner profiles and to collect information relevant to learner needs, it might be necessary to conduct skilled audits and training needs analysis. A skills audit is an assessment of the organization's needs with regard to skills and knowledge. A training needs analysis, known as a TNA, uh, provides identification of the current skills, required skills and skills gaps uh, relevant to the individual employees or learners. Just like I mentioned in the last slide, that, that short interview and that short um, uh, diagnostic drive assessment to work out what they need. A skills audit addresses organizational needs and identifies where new learning uh, will be helpful. As an example, let's say you wish to expand your current business from a single sole operator working in your own driving school to that of an industry consultant and, and trainer. You see an advertisement from a large transport company seeking an industry consultant and trainer. So the procedure that you'll put in place is going to be that you would approach a company and recommend uh, that you perform a skills audit or assessment on the organization's current needs in relations uh, to required skills and knowledge. Uh, you would then perform a training needs analysis to determine the current level of skills and knowledge amongst their employees, which you can then compare with the required skills and knowledge you've obtained in the previous uh, step, which was, of course, your skills audit. This procedure will then provide you and the organisation with the evidence required to determine where new learning will be helpful and necessary. This is a great way of gaining new business as it provides organisations with a clear path to new training opportunities, enabling them to remain compliant with industry regulations and any OHS or WHS requirements. Training needs analysis, or as we like to call them in the industry, a TNA. Uh, for most people working within industry, a TNA explains two things. Um, a process, uh, which is the training needs analysis, and also a piece of paper or a document or a template that we use uh, to uh, perform the TNA. So you may be working somewhere and someone will say, have you got the TNA with you? And that'll be uh, them referring to a document that has prescribed or set out within that template uh, the ability to perform this process. So a, a TNA identifies the skills individual employees need in order to be productive relative uh, to the organization's quality control, continuous strategies and an ability to operate at optimum efficiency. The processes involved in a TNA include conducting a job analysis or a series of job analysis, um, breaking roles and jobs down into their component parts, determining the specific competencies required to perform the analyzed tasks, uh, mapping the current competency levels or what you know the clients or learners can do at this point in time, including their skills, knowledge and attitude, um, against what is required, the performance criteria, um, to perform that particular job role or task. A TNA should also incorporate evaluation of English language, uh, literacy and numeracy skills, known as LLNN, um, and any special needs of employees or potential learners. The development of work skills takes place at the pace set by the learner. Although training programs are outcome based, they should be flexible enough for learners to demonstrate skills when they feel they have attained key competencies. Learners should not feel like they are being pressured into demonstrating work skills when they have not been provided with sufficient knowledge. Situations where work skill instruction is too regimented and does not progress at the pace of the learner can lead to a whole range of negative outcomes, such as low levels of knowledge retention, dangerous operations of equipment, procedural confusion, and lack of reporting or documenting. And for us, from a driver training point of view, that's like sending someone out to their drive test before you know that they're truly ready. They fluke it, or they get a lucky day where they get every green light and barely anyone or anything to care about. Uh, a low traffic day. Um, they scrape through on their license, yet once they get their license and move off to driving that evening or the next day by themselves, the chances of them having a crash is highly likely. A very dangerous and, and terrible situation. And and obviously in the years gone by when the driving test was incredibly easy to pass because it was so short and so little uh, that we had people 
being able to pass that situation and that's having this awful high crash rate for young inexperienced drivers. What we also need to note here is that setting a quick pace and creating unrealistic learning outcomes is not always a driving instructor's fault when we look at our industry. Uh, the fact is um, that in a lot of cases, or historically speaking, uh, driver training in Victoria has always taken on a minimization approach from, from the public. And given that we're a service industry, um, we're a little bit dictated to at different times about how much time uh, we have uh, with our clients. Uh, traditionally speaking, uh, most uh, driver training in Victoria is based upon the fact that you know parents and learners want you to do the maximum amount of teaching in the minimum amount of lessons and time. So that is a conflict of, of interest, and it is a when I say conflict of interest in that I say it's a, it conflicts with the outcomes of of us creating the the most safest, best young drivers we possibly can. Um, as a result of um, parents and students not wanting to pay exactly for that service or wanting to have that achieved in the minimal amount of time. It does make it quite difficult. So for you to uh, be able to uh, work through that and, um, and create an environment that uh, shows that you're wanting to support your learner in the, uh, in the, in the, in the amount of time that you have with them, uh, we'll have a positive outcome, but at the, like, at the, at the same stage, uh, hopefully uh, through some tactful uh, conversations, uh, you can uh, counteract uh, any unrealistic uh, learning goals um, and, and understand and, and get, we'll get the parents to understand or the client to understand that it's just not possible to make you uh, someone who is a safe driver, someone who is not going to become a uh, road statistic by spending a little bit more time with us. When the learner feels comfortable during the training and the training material is easier to understand, the learner is more likely to develop the required skills. When the material is digestible and useful, the relationship between the trainer and the learner is more likely to be positive, supportive and trusting. This in turn makes the learning process more enjoyable and far more effective for all parties. Never underestimate the importance of the learner's motivation to learn. The motivation is the driving force behind any successful training program and needs to be maintained throughout the instructional period. As you are already well aware, uh, a part of the conditions of holding a DIA here in Victoria is that you need to, uh, or you're required to, collect personal information about your learner drivers that must remain confidential. Likewise, uh, your role as a industry trainer, uh, training people within industry, still will have you collecting, storing, using and sharing information that carries with it uh, certain privacy obligations. You may be given information about the learners from your training environment, uh, workplace, RTO or parents and family of the learner, depending on their individual training context. Or you may even receive information that could be included in the training documentation that your learners provide to you, and that's for example um, a enrollment form. Alternatively, you may have sourced very general information about the learner. Whatever the source, it's important that, uh, that you remember uh, to maintain confidentiality at all times. Barriers. When developing learner profiles and identifying learner characteristics and learning needs, it is also necessary to address possible barriers to learning. Adult learners bring their life experiences to each learning situation and many of them will have attitudes, expectations and situational experiences that can affect learning. Barriers can relate directly to the type and amount of support that learners might require. Impediments to learning can come from a range of sources. These include the learner, the facilitator, other employees, situational conditions or the organisation for which the employee works. And as driver trainers, you'll need to be aware of those barriers. So whether it's a cultural issue, or like I said, a language or literacy issue, or a physical disability, uh, let alone anything to do with um, uh, individual students' uh, confidence or self-esteem, we need to be able to recognize those different types of barriers to learning and effectively work around them. So what I'm hoping that you're starting to achieve by now is, is understanding that um, in understanding and identifying learner characteristics it also allows you to identify uh, possible barriers to learning. So when identifying learner characteristics the following should also be taken into consideration. 
And even though we've already covered some of these subjects, um, I'll, I'll just run through them quickly again. And that's obviously the language literacy and numeracy needs of your clients. Any specific uh, needs or special needs that apply to any group or, or individual that you're training. Their employment status, because of course that can all come down to their availability and uh, the affordability of uh, what you offer in your training. Uh, past learning experiences, both good and bad. Uh, if your students are uh, employed, what work roles do they undertake? Uh, the age of any individual that you're training, and, and likewise if you're training groups, is there a similar uh, age group or maturity level that's applied to both that group or any individual? And obviously any cultural needs. And the reality is that identifiable barriers to learning can be categorised under the following headings, and that's uh, psychological, situational, and organisational. Uh, which I'll explain in the next few slides. Psychological barriers. These are largely personal, relating to past learning experiences or personal perceptions of ability. Learners might suffer from low self-esteem and subsequently uh, disparage their own ability, fear failure or ridicule, be overwhelmed or intimidated by others' expectations or experience, be unable to prioritise objectives, goals or activities, have memories of unsatisfactory experiences with mainstream schooling which prevent them um, from being able to take on uh, further learning or, or prevent them from opening up to new learning experiences. Have inadequate understanding of the needs and benefits of learning. Be out of practice and therefore uncertain about their own abilities and believe that they are too old to learn and come from a family or cultural background where learning is not supported. Situational barriers. Situational barriers can prevent learners from making the best use of learning opportunities. Situational barriers include time constraints, financial constraints, lack of family support, uh, lack of transport, health issues and illness and stress, cultural differences, poor study environment at home, or a lack of support in the workplace. These situational barriers exist both in the corporate training world as well as the driver training world. And for us, especially financial constraints and time constraints can have a huge impact on how much training we get to deliver to individuals uh, right across the, the broad spectrum of the types of clients that we'll receive from young people all the way up to uh, overseas drivers and, and um, needing to convert across to uh, Australian licences. Some learners will have special needs relating to disability and special needs that might require extra support or accommodation that can be physical, situational or psychological. They can include those related to hearing and sight, muscle tone, coordination, cognitive abilities, learning ability, for example dysfunctional dyslexia or even behavioural uh, dysfunction. Many barriers can be overcome through supportive structures, proper guidance, information dissemination and suitable learning opportunity development and delivery uh, methods. In some cases, technical aids and supports might be required. Consultation with experts in the specific learning fields might be valuable. And quite often, uh, remember that if it comes forward that you have a client with a special need, um, then maybe sometimes the best source to target any extra assistance that you may need may come from them themselves. They may be able to easily put you on to uh, the experts that can help you uh, uh, help you to teach them uh, to reach their goals. Hi, this is Alex from ITS. Thanks for watching. You've hit that point where we recommend that you pause this video, stretch your legs, and grab yourself a coffee. This video presentation will resume in about five seconds, so hit that pause button now. There are many different theories and classifications of learning styles and learning preferences. It is important that facilitators are aware of the differences between their learners so that they can keep all their learners engaged and motivated in the work skill instruction. One theory classifies learners according to whether they like to learn step by step or whether they like to learn globally. For example, when learning to drive a car, some learners might like to learn how to change lanes step by step and don't really need to understand the whole concept of what a lane change is or how it's even meant to look. All they will want to learn is each step in a methodical process. All that counts is that by the, end of the, by the end and application of each step in its logical sequence, they'll have successfully completed a safe lane changing manoeuvre. On the other hand, 
Some learners will require a global overview of the task before ever attempting to apply each step in its logical sequence. They'll want to see a clear demonstration of what it is, how it works, how you're meant to do it, and then fill them in with the detail beyond that. Visual, auditory and kinesthetic learners. Facilitators and work school instructors should also, when identifying uh, learning to be delivered and when discussing proposed programs with prospective learners, make some effort to determine what each person's individual learning preferences are. Some people prefer to learn by reading books or listening to lectures. Others prefer experiential or interactive learning, and others want to experiment in order to learn. One of the ways of explaining learning preferences, and there are many different tests and explanations that relate to learning preferences, is to say that people are auditory, visual or kinesthetic learners. As mentioned before, Intelligent Training Solutions believe, I guess, in some ways the basic concept of learning styles, but at the same time uh, there is now uh, several different uh, papers that have been released and studies that have been released that probably say that uh, most people would at different times apply different learning styles to the different situations in which they're trying to learn. Um, and as a result of that, maybe no one is in, in particular uh, pigeonholed to any uh, one of those three uh, preferences uh, holistically. Auditory learners. Auditory learners learn by listening. They love to talk, are attracted to sound, and prefer to hear things rather than read them. They love the telephone and music, read in a conversational style, hearing the text as they go, or appear to daydream whilst holding uh, internal dialogues. Auditory learners prefer to learn through lectures and verbal instructions, anecdotal stories, audio tapes, discussion pairs or groups, variety in tone, rate, pitch and volume, music or slogans, and using questions and answer formats. You could probably say this presentation, uh, delivered like this with my voiceover, is better suited to auditory learners compared to those who will just open up this uh, slideshow and uh, read through it at their own pace and either turn me down uh, so they can't hear my voice or uh, just use the other selection uh, from the student portal where they can read it at their own pace. Visual learners. Visual learners need to see what is going on. They like reading and television. They enjoy looking at photos and plans and diagrams or cartoons. Words like see, look, appear, picture, make clear an overview attract their attention. They probably have strong spelling and writing skills. They may not talk too much, dislike listening for too long, and are distracted by untidiness or movement. Visual learners prefer to learn through a demonstration of skills and activities, posters, charts, diagrams and graphs, visual displays, booklets, brochures and handouts, and a variety of colours and shapes. And as mentioned in the previous sl slide, would most likely uh, download this presentation without the voiceover and read through it at their own pace. Kinesthetic learners. Kinesthetic learners learn by doing. They move around a lot, tap pens or shift in their seat. They want lots of breaks, enjoy games and do not really like reading. They remember best through performing tasks themselves and, and through practice. Kinesthetic learners prefer to learn through a hands-on experience, team activities and role plays, note taken and emotional discussions. Funny enough, they're the type of people that say, hey, just you know, show me once, give me a go at it, I'll learn as I do it. In regards to learning styles and the different uh, characteristics or um, categorizing of uh, learning styles, the, the important thing to understand that no one, pre no one individual preference is better or worse than any other. Uh, each person will have a preference for one of the, these styles. However, as a facilitator or work skill instructor, uh, you should be able to use a combination of those learning methods or tools, as learners will often relate to more than one preference. Uh, facilitators and work skill instructors who have an understanding of the preferential characteristics that learners might display can use this understanding to ensure learning uh, comfort and psychological safety um, is, is there and, and entrenched. Uh, the great thing, once again, about using DEDICT or a DIP uh, training styles within our context of uh, training uh, drivers or novice learner drivers is that both those systems use uh, and tap into all the different learning styles from global to analytic uh, to kinesthetic auditory and visual all of those different learning styles are covered by using DEDICT or a DIP. Honey and Mumford's model Honey and Mumford's model identifies four types of learning preferences. 
interactivists, reflectors, uh, theorists and pragmatists. If you were to ask an activist how they learn, they'd probably most likely say that I'd like to have a go and see what happens, kind of like uh, the kinesthetic learners from the slides before. If you were to ask a reflector how they would explain their uh, learning style, I'd, they'd say that they'd like to gather information and mull things over, probably theorise and, and work out and run through some what they believe would be logical conclusions uh, before they make up their mind on what they think would be the most correct answer to something and then come up with that and, and hold on to that information. Theorists, if we were to ask them how they, how they learn, uh, they'd say that they'd like to tidy up and, and reach some conclusions. So therefore a little bit like reflectors, uh, in some ways run things out, have a think about it and then uh, reach conclusions as a result of that. And then of course there's our pragmatists, and if we were to ask a pragmatist how they learn, they will probably say that they like uh, tried and tested techniques that are relevant uh, to their own individual problems uh, or problem solving at the time. Out of all the different learning uh, styles and, and principles I guess that you need to consider, one that you should always keep in the back of the mind um, whenever teaching young adults uh, or even uh, adults through our work role as uh, driver trainers is that uh, the principles of adult learning certainly apply. There are a number of principles of adult learning that you need to be familiar with when facilitating adult learners and these are and first up and most importantly that adults have a need to be self-directing and decide for themselves what they want to learn. From a driver trainer point of view uh, that's easily carried out by you know someone jumps in our car uh, we say g'day welcome to today's lesson this is what I have planned for you however before we head off is there anything that you would like us uh, to, to cover as well and by bringing learners on board and allowing them to feel like they have um, some sense of control over the direction and destiny of their learning uh, they're going to be uh, far more uh, in, in engaged and interactive with you uh, as as a part of the adult learning principles, it, it is one of those uh, boxes that they need to tick, that they feel that they have some control over the direction and destiny of their learning. Uh, the second point, adults have a range of life experience and connecting learning to experience is meaningful. So of course, it's that classic case of when we spoke before about a little bit about that diagnostic assessment and, and what we do through a TNA, a training needs analysis, by uh, just having a, a, a quick talk to, to anyone, no matter how young or old they are, within an educational setting, asking them you know, what they do and what their interests are and, and what have they done before, uh, we hopefully pick up some of those uh, life's experiences, whether it's through uh, just their own activities or, or work or, or um, social um, uh, situations that we can tap into and use that and give that some uh, relevance to uh, the information that we're trying to pass on. Uh, point number three, adults have a need to know why they are learning something very important and especially for our global learners who need to understand uh, the relevance of what they're being taught uh, so they can uh, prioritize it put it in a place where they believe it's important and you want that to occur otherwise you can be uh, trying your best all day every day uh, to be passing on information and teaching people and facilitating a learning pathway but unless you can uh, clearly uh, define and early on define hey this is why we need to learn this uh, you'll quite often find learners that are disengaged and, um, and won't be there. Uh, at the end of the day most adults feel like they're time poor so therefore we need to connect uh, that learning with relevance and meaningfulness like I spoke about uh, at the start of this presentation and a part of that is, is to understand and clearly identify with your clients why they're learning something. That is so important that in that space and place that we connect that to a meaningful um, outcome for them. Uh, the, the second last point is that adults need to be respected. Of course, uh, uh, respect is a two-way street and uh, definitely adults need to feel like they're being respected. Uh, otherwise, they will find it hard and struggle to listen to what you have to offer uh, because if they don't believe you respect them, uh, why should they respect anything that you have to say? And that the final top point is that adults prefer learning to be relevant and practical. Of course, as, as adults, like I said, we all tend to be time poor. It ties back into that third point that um, unless we uh, can uh, offer value uh, for, to time uh, uh, and uh, concentration levels and money for any person undertaking training with us, if it doesn't seem to be relevant and practical, uh, they're going to disengage pretty quickly. The implication of these adult learning principles is that during some or all of the stages of facilitating workplace learning, you should 1. Involve the learner in the process of identifying their own learning needs. 
Two, involve the learner in the process of planning their learning in consultation with others, and that includes yourself. And generally speaking, those first two points uh, from a driving and training point of view, it's just covered when the client first gets in the car at the start of each lesson and you might say, hey, you know, this is what I've got planned. What do you think? What should we do? And allow them to have a little bit of feedback. And, and, and we spoke about it in the last slide, but obviously have some sort of uh, direction uh, in, in what's going to happen uh, on an individual, you know, driver lesson basis and also on the, the big picture in them becoming better, safer drivers. Uh, three, encourage mutual responsibility of both the learner and the facilitator for the learning process and that's really important. We can't have uh, facilitators or trainers or you as a driving instructor wanting uh, the positive outcomes more than your client. It, it's an unhealthy situation, it'll make for very lazy learners, it tends to mean that the trainer will start to do the work uh, for the for the uh, learner, which is no good for anyone, um, and yeah, and like I said, it doesn't make for a, a good educational pathway. Uh, the second last point: help the learner to manage their own learning and self evaluation. Generally speaking, that's effective questioning, good open questions that promote uh, a little bit of self reflection, and uh, finally, think of ways that will ensure the learning will be useful in real life situations. Once again, we're pretty lucky uh, for, for situations like that as driver trainers. Uh, generally speaking, our classroom is moving along at 60 k's an hour and we're teaching something that is already uh, in a real life situation uh, as we unfold and, and deliver that message or, or that education. Help the learner discover for themselves through real or simulated experiences the gaps between where they are now and where they want to be. Ensure any new situations, materials and methods are related to your learner's past experiences. Continually acknowledge that the past experience of your learner are a useful and valuable tool to use when facilitating learning and when choosing processes, techniques and activities. Make sure that the content of the learning event meets the needs of the learner and continues to be relevant and sequence the content so it stays in tune with the participants development tasks and develop an environment where the learner feels respected. Cross difference learning relationships. While training facilitators and especially driving instructors and learners always differ in some ways, when the differences seem particularly large to one or both parties, it is known as cross-difference learning. You may recognise one key difference such as race, age, culture, ability, learning style, job function or gender, or you could differ on several dimensions. Cross-difference learning can be an exciting opportunity for both you and your learner to experience and learn new things. You should see cross-difference learning as an opportunity for professional development and an opportunity to learn. And obviously for most of you students, by the time you've tackled this subject, provide work skill instruction, you'll have already gone through TLIG, uh, work in a socially diverse environment, and you will thoroughly know and understand uh, how much intelligent training solutions, and, and, and in particular Alex and myself, uh, truly um, uh, appreciate and recognise how uh, cross-difference learning uh, is such a wonderful experience and something that should be embraced and taken and seen as a wonderful opportunity to not only uh, improve the learning experience but also you know, with a little bit of luck uh, make yourself uh, and maybe your client a better person or better people as a, as a result of that. Special needs. If you are working with people who have special needs you're not expected to immediately know how to support them. The important thing is to find out. There are a number of sources of information that you could use um, and access to, to find ways of helping people. And that really starts you know, primarily with asking the person who requires the support. Quite often, uh, individuals who are faced with particular challenges understand and, and can point you in the right direction uh, right from the start on how to best help them. Uh, you can also obviously ask colleagues refer back to your, your driving school that you may be working with or fellow driving instructors and of course you're always welcome to call uh, us here at Intelligent Training Solutions uh, to see if there's any uh, avenues that we can point you in. Uh, you can also locate specific support networks, uh, contact your state training authority and obviously search the internet. If you're not sure where to start, access the website of your state training authority all the state and territory uh, uh, training authority websites are listed via links and contact on the www.training.gov.au website. Confirm a safe learning environment. Safety implications when conducting work school instruction will relate to the fact that people are more vulnerable 
and more likely to have accidents or be involved in near misses when learning new skills. This is especially true when it comes to teaching novice learner drivers. When learning is delivered in an environment other than that of a classroom, safety must be a consideration. The learning environment must comply with health and safety requirements and trainers need to be aware of their duty of care with regard to learners, other stakeholders and public safety. The learning environment is an important resource. The work skill instruction you provide will occur in a location that is most appropriate for the skills being taught. No matter where this is, it is your responsibility to make sure that the environment is a safe and comfortable one. A training environment that is too hot or too cold, or where the trainee cannot see or hear the trainer, or whether it distractions can have a big impact on the effectiveness of your training session. Consider the safety and comfort of your learner. This may include temperature, lighting, noise and distractions. From a driver training point of view, it, that we're talking about your vehicle and the on-road environment. And the reality is we have a greater challenge than most other trainers in any situation. Our classroom, you know, moves, it, it can travel at 100 kilometers per hour, it can be stuck in traffic, you can have other you know, driver, uh, drivers uh, toot their horn at it and have unexpected situations arise. So being able to uh, make that environment as comfortable as possible is so important uh, because uh, compared to most other classrooms, we are constantly surrounded by distractions and other needs pulling away our clients' uh, attention. So we need to consider that and, and work through that and make it as, uh, as a safe and uh, uh, conducive environment for learning as best we can. We have enough challenges as it is. OH&S and WHS considerations in the learning environment. Facilitators have a responsibility for the safety of their learners in all practice environments. OH&S and WH&S is equally relevant and important in a workplace setting where learners are working and learning on site or in the workplace, a workplace where the facilitator may not have direct control over the learning environment, an external organisation where the facilitator is providing work school instruction off-site, a classroom or training room, and a simulated work environment. While the types of risks and hazards may differ from each setting, OH&S and WHS is equally relevant and important to all of them. And likewise, that typically applies to us as driver training. Uh, we must have a roadworthy vehicle. We must ensure that we pick environments that uh, challenge our, our students and our clients, but don't uh, place them in uh, direct danger or, or put them in environments that far exceed uh, their ability to handle a situation. Um, but most importantly, making sure that car is roadworthy uh, is the basic uh, of all steps that must be undertaken right from the start. Learners should be made aware of any safety requirements. They and the work school instructors must know how and when to report hazards, accidents, near miss incidents, injuries and illness. If the, trainer, if the training is to be conducted on work premises, both facilitators and learners need to be aware of any organisational systems, policies and processes related to safety, and that usually includes any induction process. Uh, occupational health and safety procedures are cyclical. If an OHS or WHS issue is identified, then it needs to be resolved and then checked in and tested again to ensure that that near miss uh, or that incident uh, doesn't turn into a larger scale um, uh, injury or, or a serious event. Confirm a safe learning environment. Facilitators and work skill instructors should keep the learners informed of any OHS and WHS issues throughout the skills instruction process. This includes providing them with information on OHS inductions, exit locations and requirements, personal protective equipment requirements, emergency procedures and safe use of equipment. Your learners have a role to play too, but the level of their responsibility may be minimal. If they are an employee or a learner driver or on a work placement, they have a general duty of care for themselves and others and this may include following any OH&S, WHS policies and procedures are already in place. The safe use of equipment, attending OH&S and WHS training and helping to identify hazards. From a driver trainer's point of view, uh, most, most often at the start of the, the first time you ever teach anyone or have a client in your vehicle, you'll most likely establish a safety language of when you want the client to brake or accelerate or even when you want them to uh, take their hands and feed off the controls of the car uh, as you intervene in, in a situation. You'll probably remind them that if you're reaching over and 
gently moving the wheel, that they don't fight you for that, and they let you move the wheel in the direction that's required, no matter what they feel or think. And likewise, not to panic if they feel you on the accelerator, the brake, or even the clutch or gears in a manual car, because that's just your way of um, uh, kicking in at a time to maintain a safe learning environment. And you should always establish that um, at the start of any uh, learning program with a new client, and likewise at any stage, you know, reinforce that when you feel it's necessary. Gather and check instruction and demonstration objectives and seek assistance if required. The following slides in some ways go about explaining the need for demonstration and uh, training techniques that in some ways um, is a lighter uh, perspective on the whole dedict and adip uh, methods of training that is explained in greater detail in the other presentation associated with this topic and also TLIM 4001A um, develop safe car driving behaviours and others. So I would always uh, remind uh, any student that uh, when it comes to this topic, TAE uh, 301A, uh, DEL 301A, that uh, you not only look at this presentation but also the other one uh, as it is a much more hands-on approach to driver training and in goes into greater detail the dedict and adip methods of training that is uh, very much suited to what we do. However, demonstration is the act of showing someone or of making evident to them what they will need to do. The objective or the proposed outcome of the demonstration must be made clear to the learners. The training facilitator, coach, mentors, driving instructor's task is that of providing information, demonstration of new skills, support, opportunities for practice and of contextualising learning to meet the needs of the learners. They must utilise good communication and interpersonal skills uh, to ensure that learners are aware of the ways in which they'll be able to apply new skills developed as a result of the training and work skill instruction. In most instances, work skill instruction will begin with a demonstration and explanation of what is required. For instance, a driving instructor teaching a new staff member to reverse park would demonstrate how to do it and when to do it. That's the D in dedict. Uh, the demonstration would be accompanied by instruction. The employee learner would then be expected to reproduce this event. A person providing training on how to use a computer would show the learners how to use the various computer tools and programs by showing the learners how they work and what procedures to follow to make them work. And the great thing for us with Dedict is that that's the demonstration, the explanation, the demonstrating of it slowly, and then we'd start to move into the imitate and the coaching. The same process applies in most training situations. The required procedure is demonstrated so that learners are aware of what to do and what the necessary objective or outcome is. The trainer, coach or mentor provides explanation of what is being done and information about why it should be done that way. Background information and underpinning knowledge relating to what is expected of the learner would accompany the demonstration at the time of the demonstration or even as a separate theory session. By producing what is required, the trainer not only demonstrates the procedures to be followed, but provides a demonstration of the standard expected with regard to the final outcome of the procedures. That is, the demonstration uh, objective. And for us, that's the first D in dedict, the E in explanation, and especially the second D in dedict, which is the demonstrate and the slowing down and of, of breaking the task up, where we explain all the skills, attitude and knowledge uh, required to uh, perform each task and each step involved in whatever we happen to be training at that time. The advantage of demonstration is that 1. It is useful for visual learners. 2. It enables learners to see the processes involved in achieving specific objectives. And 3. It enables learners to see the end product. So we're covering global learners, analytical learners, it helps visual learners, and generally speaking through uh, the talking and, and maybe writing of notes through that whole process because that can occur during demonstration. Uh, we also start to tick off the boxes for our visual and auditory learners as well. Access and review relevant learning resources and learning materials for suitability and relevance and seek assistance to interpret the contextual application. Uh, although that uh, heading and title uh, totally pertains to the TAE environment of someone that is training in either maybe formal qualifications or units of competence out there in a workplace. It also has a lot of relevance for us uh, as driver trainers and in particular the two main texts or the two main resources that you're going to use and one being the road safety rules 
2009 and the VicRoads drive test criteria. It's obviously important for us that we ensure that we're always using the latest versions of both those uh, uh, texts and that we uh, clearly um, understand and are able to interpret uh, what the road rules are saying and, and also the Vic Rose Drive test criteria so we can take that information uh, and, and from that draw a, um, a way in which to teach it which will be meaningful and relevant to our clients. So as it says here, resources is a term that covers just about everything involved in training apart from the learner and the objectives. It even includes you, the facilitator. As a facilitator, you may be required to access and develop your own resources. However, in the context of this unit of study, the resources are already developed and all you have to do is use them effectively. The learning resources you are supplied with could include support materials for training packages or courses, a list of useful websites, workplace developed learning resources including PowerPoint presentations and manuals, access to materials such as computers with internet connections, printers and projectors, and online support materials such as uh, learning management systems. You can also include competency standards, audio visual to tools such as videos, CDs and audio files, uh, printed reference materials such as manuals and tech textbooks, records and logbooks, special resources such as workplace English language and literacy uh, program developed resources or resources produced in a language other than in English uh, to cater for specific audiences. For us as driver trainers that might mean accessing uh, the VicRoads website or uh, some driver training uh, websites in, in different languages which are available. Uh, the machinery, technology and equipment that you and your learners need to access and any protective equipment necessary for occupational health and safety. Learning materials that may also be prepared and available for you to use include more specific items such as handouts, task sheets, workplace procedural documentation, research tasks, workbooks, activity sheets, overhead transparencies or PowerPoint slides, scenarios, projects and assignments, uh, case studies and role plays and any topic unit subject information sheets. As a driver trainer, uh, we have, if we were to categorize these uh, learning resources, like I said, I guess we can start from the top, which is you and your vehicle, moving down to the the road rules and the Vic Rose Drive Test Criteria and the Learner Logbook and um, the the Guide to to Solo Driving, and then maybe in particular, um, you know, drawings that you may have intersections or or any text or uh, material that you may use in your vehicle. I know of uh, several instructors that have little. Uh, whiteboards in their car where they draw scenarios or, or, or write things down and, and, they, and that material that's on that whiteboard at that particular time it becomes their learning resource that they use. Work-based learning that leads to a nationally recognized qualification must be delivered by qualified trainers and assessors. The training might be delivered in the workplace as off-the-job training or is it a combination of both on and off-the-job training. Blended learning online and on-the-job strategies might also be used. When designing and delivering training, an RTO might use programs and materials which are already in existence or they may write their own programs and training plans. As a qualified driving instructor, uh, the reality is you'll probably uh, develop some materials, hopefully whilst you know on this course, that you can use as a template as you move forward into industry, uh, developing that further and, and having a whole set of uh, learning resources that help you uh, do your job more effectively um, and that way catering to a wide variety of clients and, and their so-called uh, learning styles rather than just thinking that me just sitting there talking all day uh, can certainly be the best way or the only way uh, people need to learn anything from me. That's, that's a trap for fools and, and that's not going to be good for business in the long term. It's quite clear that the next few slides information uh, is important to this unit of competence and our ability to um, negotiate, or not negotiate, but to uh, successfully complete this unit of competence. But it is quite clear that as a you know, Cert 4 car driving instructor, uh, the following information from a job point of view, and as you are about to enter industry over the next year or two, quite frankly has uh, very little to do with your job. And in some ways we wish we didn't even have to cover this information, but unfortunately we, we need to. Uh, so hang on there and, and learn from it and if you're certainly going to come back and do further study uh, in the TAE uh, qualification or uh, want to come back and do particular skill sets or 
uh, broad and what you can do as a driver trainer, then this information will uh, become much more relevant and, and important. But the fact is, as a driving instructor, mainly working with novice drivers on the attainment of becoming safe drivers and their license, I've got to admit this information uh, really isn't that uh, critical to you. But nonetheless, I'm going to deliver it to you and, and hopefully you can learn from it. So training pa packages provide a framework for training. They provide the basis for vocational education and training, the VET system, and programs that lead to participants achieving nationally recognised company standards and qualifications. In actual fact, it's exactly what you're doing right now. You are learning to become a car driving instructor, and your qualification comes from the Transport and Logistics Training Package. Within that training package, uh, there are qualifications on how to become uh, a captain of a cargo ship, a pilot of an aeroplane, uh, how to um, drive a train or work as a conductor. Uh, at the same time too, there's qualifications there on uh, truck driving and freight and transport and logistics and warehousing and, and pretty much anything to do with uh, the movement of materials or people via air, uh, ocean or road. And that even includes taxi drivers. They're a part of the transport and logistics training package. However, these training packages offer a correlated study units and competency requirements, uh, standards for assessment that can be brought together to support accreditations, and the qualifications uh, gained by learners who complete the necessary courses or programs to make up a qualification. Uh, packaging of training is intended to provide clear, consistent standards, uh, performance criteria and learning outcomes, applicable to the needs and expectations of industry and clients. At the same time, the learning and assessment systems are designed to accommodate the needs of people in supported employment, uh, learners with disabilities, disadvantaged learners, and those who have previously had difficulties with traditional learning systems, and those who have developed but not received recognition for existing work competencies. Now once again, this material is quite relevant if you're going to enter industry as a uh, as a TAE qualified trainer, but as a driving instructor, you're not going to be working within the VET system, you're not going to be dealing with units of competence, and you're certainly not going to be de dealing with um, the training or, or the use of uh, complete training packages or qualifications. However, if you wish to do more, if you wish to come and work for a company like us, then you will need to uh, successfully complete the TAE, and you will need to understand uh, the information that we've we've gone through here. But that would all be fleshed out and, and taken care of uh, through that TAE course. To provide adequate learning and assessment services, trainers and training facilitators and assessors need a ra range of resources to support the training, learning and assessment processes. These are referred to as training package support materials and can include learner guides, assessment tools, professional development materials and trainee record books and the list goes on. This unit, as well as all the others within the TLI 41210 qualification, um, have learner guides that can be per purchased. And at the beginning of each of, the, of these sessions, uh, presentations, we refer to them and advise you of actually how you can purchase them. If you think back to this presentation, I think it's about slide number three. As a trainer and or assessor, you'll have the freedom to choose which particular training package support materials you use to meet the outcomes of the training package and the needs of clients and learners. They can select support materials uh, from a range of sources and or can design or adapt their own support materials. Assessment leading to nationally recognised AQF qualifications and statements of attainment in the VET sector must meet the requirements of the Australian Quality Training Framework as expressed in the Standards for Registered Organisations or tra Registered Training Organisations. These can be downloaded from the National Skills Standards Council uh, website. Assessors must ensure that they have a clear understanding of what is required with regard to endorsed training package components and awarded qualifications and the tools and other materials they use must meet the required standards and fit the identified benchmarks. Understanding of training packages and units of competence at specific levels within the packages enables proposed work-based learning pathways to be evalu evaluated against appropriate criteria. Uh, this would be all very interesting and relevant to you if you were going to move into the TAE. However, as a driver trainer, uh, teaching people how to bec uh, become safe drivers and, and, and pass their license, uh, this information has uh, little if no relevance to you at all. At this stage, I'm going to uh, end this uh, presentation on this topic. Uh, if you do wish to uh, move on into the TAE qualification or have a little bit of interest on what a training package is then by all means uh, contact us and let us know because I can let you have a look at some information or certainly explain to you the benefit or, or um, of, of 
moving on to the Cert Forte at the completion or whilst uh, uh, doing this qualification. However, I'll end it now because even though um, what a training package is is important and and or not important is interesting, uh, it's not quite important to the job role that you're going to undertake. But please understand that pretty much all the information that we've covered in this uh, presentation, bar the last couple of slides, has direct relevance and contextualization uh, to the driver training industry. And I assure you that if you can take the information that we've covered in this uh, presentation and adapt it to your driving school, then you are going to be running at a level of detail and professionalism uh, that pretty much covers every other driving school in Melbourne, including the big players like RACV and Excel and, and whatever the case may be. Of course, these large-scale sc schools definitely have a lot of uh, professional development and quality assurance, but they're not under the pressure to, to run at a level that's required uh, for the vocational education and training sector. So if you pick up this information and apply it in your driving school, it's only going to benefit you and your clients. Uh, beyond that, I, I thank you for listening and, and participating in this class, and feel free to contact Intelligent Training Solutions or Alex or myself um, at any stage for any further assistance. I thank you for listening. Hi, this is Jess from ITS. Thanks for watching. If you just liked this video, well, you know where that button is. But if you liked it, hit that like button at the bottom of your screen. Get subscribed and consider giving us a comment and a thumbs up on Facebook. Your efforts do a lot for our business.